Okay, thanks everybody for uh, finding a chair. We're going to try to keep moving here and keep close to schedule. Um, this, uh, this starts our series of three panels, and the, and the first panel is going to focus on current statewide initiatives and supports for advancing prevention programs, prevention services, youth development in Colorado. So we have a, a panel of four uh, leaders from Colorado's uh, probably most significant youth development and, and prevention departments and offices, you might say. Um, I'm going to be asking them several questions about their current prevention initiatives that are funded and supported by their offices and ask them to reflect a bit on progress and challenges to date. So um, with us today, uh, starting at the far end, is Ali Maffey from Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. Uh, next is Phyllis Reed, who is Assistant Director of Health and Wellness Office from the Colorado State Department of Education. Um, let's see, who is next? Jenny Wood, of course, Jenny. <laughs> Uh, she's the uh, Director of Community Prevention and Early Intervention Programs from the Office of Behavioral Health in Colorado. And Christy Griffith-Jones from Tony Gramps' Youth Services, uh, which funds a lot of programs for, for young people in, in our state. So th with that, I'm going to ask uh, each, of the, each of the panelists to talk just uh, briefly about current prevention initiatives that are coming from each of their offices um, and perhaps what the primary goals uh, of those initiatives are. Um, Allie, do you want to start us out? And Thanks. All right, happy to be here. I'm a GSSW alum as well, so Yay. really happy to be here. Um, so I uh, manage the Policy and Communication Unit um, within the Violence and Injury Prevention Mental Health Promotion Branch at the State Health Department. And so uh, we have the funding for CTC to fund, as uh, David so eloquently described, the operating system, essentially. Um, so it's a major part of prevention efforts, but it's not everything, as you'll hear um, from some of the other funding from partners here, as well as other partners around the state, the 1451 programs, Senate Bill 94, where there's a lot of um, uh, state dollars going towards prevention programming um, and prevention systems change within the state. So as you heard, we fund 48 communities within the state with the goal of substance abuse prevention explicitly because it is funded through marijuana tax cash dollars, but we're also evaluating it in partnership with the um, Center for the Study and Prevention of Violence at CU Boulder. We're evaluating it for outcomes related to violence. Um, at, you heard my the branch where my program sits. Um, so we have a lot of interest in sexual violence prevention, um, suicide prevention, other interpersonal violence prevention. Um, and so we're definitely evaluating it for a variety of outcomes. Um, we're currently um, in year two of, uh, so as, he, as David said, between 12 and 18 months, depending on which funding cycle community came in. Um, we are, uh, with only being in year two, the communities are really just getting started. They're just building that buy-in. They're um, doing that hard systems change work that Nate Riggs talked about, where um, really trying to figure out what does it mean for our community to have a prevention plan. Um, not our agency. This is not an agency plan. This is a community plan. Um, uh, I, Blair, who's with um, SDRG, always says it's not about the coordinator that cares, it's about the community that cares. <laughs> and so really trying to make sure it's not about the CTC coordinator doing all the work or you know, which, whichever champion on the group doing all the work, but that it's truly the community coming together and saying, you know, we have funding from CDE, how does that contribute? Or we have TGYS funding, how does that contribute? Or we don't have either of those, and our community needs that. What does it mean for us to become competitive to get that type of funding, to really flush out the entire spectrum of prevention and treatment? Um, I loved the questions that came up regarding treatment and trauma, um, because it, you can't do prevention in isolation. It has to include both of those things. So what does it mean for our community to, all, to do all of that work? Now, like I said, we're funding CTC, so we're funding the operating system. We're not necessarily funding the, all of the interventions that go along with that, um, because there are other funding opportunities to, um, to address some treatment and other prevention efforts. Um, so I think you kind of heard a lot about what's going on here. Always happy to answer more questions, but with that, I'll pass it along. Good morning, y'all. I'm not from Colorado, so um, if you have any problems understanding some of the things I'm saying, let me know. I'm from Texas. <laughs> 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 Through uh, our health and wellness office at uh, CDE, I wanted to uh, talk with you a minute about a really exciting program that we have 
and it's a school health professional grant program. And we have received $12.3 million funding um, from excess tax revenue, so there's a theme there, <laughs> of marijuana. And so um, in this grant program, we are in our third cycle of this. With the expanded money this year, though, this has, uh, this is the expanded cycle that has brought an extra $9.1 million into the original funding, which has allowed us uh, to fund 54 districts and grants, uh, dis districts and charters throughout the state. And this allows these districts that are doing the school health professional grant work to be able to hire school health professionals such as school counselors, school nurses, school psychologists, and social workers. Those are the four areas they can hire in. And the purpose of their work is to be able to provide substance abuse and uh, behavioral health care to students that are at risk and uh, in those areas with a major focus around the marijuana education also. Additionally, they are able to implement the substance abuse programs, uh, prevention programs, and to the schools, uh, not just to the at-risk students, but to all students in the classroom. And so it is really, really important for them to start out at the beginning of their grant to build relationships with their parents, with their other uh, educators in the building, uh, develop a trust relationship with the students, with the families, other community members, and understand what other community support is out there as we really focus on that behavioral health tier model of tier one, tier two, tier three, with tier one and tier two happening in the schools with that health care. And then if it goes to a need for a student in the tier three, making that connection with other community partners that they have out there. These school health professionals will be able to, um, when they receive behavioral health referrals from anyone in the building, in their school building, they will start that student screening process to actually focus on and address the actual issues and needs of the student at the time and make decisions on if they can keep that support and care there at the school and district level or if they need that extended support throughout the community. So um, I cannot even tell you how exciting and overwhelming it is right now with 54 districts and charters, but um, I'm not the Lone Ranger dealing with this grant. I do have a partner in crime that is uh, my other TA provider that it will be providing uh, technical assistance to the districts and charters in the southern half of the state and then I'll provide that TA to uh, the districts and charters in the northern and western part of the state. So the work's just beginning and um, we are just trying to get resources and support out to them as quickly as we can as they get their work plan and their feet under them and um, more information to come. Good morning. Happy Halloween. <laughs> Nobody's in costumes. No. No. I was glad to make it out of the house without my son's <laughs> face paint, which he was not pleased with my face painting job, not my expertise. So I'm Jenny Wood with Office of Behavioral Health, which sits within Colorado Department of Human Services. And I oversee the Community Prevention and Early Intervention Unit. And what we do is we receive funding from a variety of different sources, mainly federal funding, and then we broker out those funds with about 60 different providers throughout the state to provide substance abuse, misuse, prevention work within their local communities. One of our main funding sources you may have heard, um, it's from SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration, CSAP, which is the Center for Substance Abuse Prevention. I'm trying not to throw acronyms without telling you what they are. And we receive the 
prevention portion of the block grant and then contract out with um, a competitive process. And that's broken out into a few subsets. We have community grants and statewide grants. The statewide grants are pretty obvious. They are aimed at serving the entire state of Colorado. And there's a few projects that we run out of the statewide side. One is training and technical assistance, which I think everyone should know about because regardless if whether or not you're a grantee of OBH, you are able to access the general technical assistance for prevention. And if you need more information, my contact information is not up there, but we can uh, get that we to can you. Get that to you. Yes. yes. And the training and technical assistance portion also, we put on regional prevention conferences every year, which we just had our resort and um, rural set in Gunnison. And then we also have an annual prevention workforce development training that we do. And as I mentioned, the technical assistance that's available to anyone. We have a parents and caregivers project that we contract out currently. And we know that parents and caregivers are the first line of defense when working with youth with substance abuse. So that program is aimed at giving parents and caregivers skills on how to create a positive environment to produce like a healthy kid. And one of the other statewide projects that we have, as I'm sure everyone's know, seen in the media, our country is in the midst of an opiate crisis or epidemic, depending which field you're coming from. SAMHSA does not like us to say epidemic, so that's why I say crisis, because they fund the majority of our programs. <laughs> we work with two providers through the block grant funds to work on the prescription drug, mainly opiate, misuse. One is the Colorado Consortium for Prescription Drug Abuse, and they are currently wrapping up a toolkit. It should be done any day now, which can be used for communi to community coalitions to be able to access different solutions to the crisis in their community, and that will also come with some technical assistance, so they will come to your communities and train you on how to best use the toolkit for your community. Another one of our funding streams is a SAMHSA discretionary grant, which means that it's, you know, there's a short term for it, five years. And that is the Strategic Prevention Framework Prevention or Partnership for Success Grant. And we currently are funding five community coalitions to look at reducing underage drinking, reducing substance misuse, and prescription drugs. The one that I'm going to talk about that I'm most excited about because I feel like it's a different lens and we're taking prevention, um, we're tackling the opiate issue in a different way, I should say. It's the state targeted response to the opiate crisis and you may have heard about the, these funds. It was in the media, Tom Price talked a lot about it and he's no longer there with um, Health and Human Services. but. The, these funds were distributed to states, emergency funds, and what we're doing with the money is something that I feel like is way different and so exciting. We're incorporating prevention and treatment in one model, and what we're doing is we're using two evidence-based practices. One is the community reinforcement approach family training. I'm gonna have to take a drink. I had a sick child, so I'm having a little voice difficulty. And this model historically is a treatment model and it's aimed at working with a significant other caregiver of the person that's entering treatment for a substance use disorder. And what it does is it teaches that person skills on how to motivate the person entering treatment rather than what people tend to do when you have someone in your family who's using substances say things that might set them off or make them mad so it's more of a positive communications type skill-based learning for the significant other. What I did was I approached the model developer and said, what do you think about adapting this to include a prevention component? Because more than likely, the person that will be going through craft will also be in the sphere of influence of the children. So why don't we look at adding prevention procedures? And he said, sure, let's do it. So we did it, and we recently trained around 25 providers throughout the state and we're getting to roll out craft with the prevention component for families that have a parent with opiate use disorder. And we're also gonna be using Celebrating Families, which is going to also be implemented any day now. We finally hired our person who will be starting today. And um, she's gonna be very busy. So that sums up our work. I know that I can't cover everything because that's a lot. So. Okay. 
Thank you. Chris. Good morning. Uh, I'm Christy Griffith Jones, a TGYS program administrator. Um, Tony Graham says youth services, also known as TIGIES by my contract and fiscal um, specialist. So we som you'll sometimes hear us say TIGIES. Uh, so Tony <coughs> Graham says youth services program is housed in the Division of Child Welfare uh, within the Office of Children, Youth, and Families at um, the Department of Human Services. And it's been there for, Allie, like four years now? Have we been there? Four or five, I think? So we moved over um, a few years ago. And uh, what we do is provide grant funds to uh, programs for prevention, intervention, and education um, programs around child abuse and neglect, uh, youth crime and violence, and marijuana prevention. Um, it originally started as a youth crime and violence prevention program uh, back in the days when um, it was after the summer of violence and Tony Gramsis um, really pushed for this funding. So thus the name of the program now. Um, but it's grown to encompass the child ab abuse and neglect component and the marijuana prevention component um, in the last several years, um, and that's all, all in legislation. So we're really guided by legislation. Um, we also have a 13-member board who makes the majority of our decisions. So um, each grant cycle, the board decides on um, funding priorities. And we just had our request for application this past fall and started our new grant cycle uh, July 1st. So we are in the beginning of the first year of a three-year grant cycle. We had uh, applications, let's see, 180 applications asking for over $27 million in funding, and we were given approximately 10 million. So needless to say, um, there were a lot of folks who did not receive funding, um, and our board this year decided to reduce funding um, for some grantees based on their scores in order to fund more programs. So that was one of the, a new decision that kind of came as a shock to some of our grantees um, who did not receive full funding. Um, and it, of course, makes us sad that that happened, but we're also really happy that there are several um, programs that receive funding because of this decision. So we um, currently are funding 93 grantees across the state for 125 programs. And our largest grant, I believe, is uh, 800,000, and our smallest is around 25,000. So it's a wide um, range of grants that are available, um, and we do fund programs throughout the state. Um, a couple of other decisions that our board made this year uh, was to fund programs in rural areas. So there were some programs who, some areas of the state who were not going to receive funding because there were no um, applications that scored high enough, but the uh, board really wanted to make sure that some of our rural areas were served and at least received some funding. So they prioritized those areas. They also prioritized restorative justice programs and violence prevention programs. So anyone who received a qualifying score, which was 70 or higher, um, and provides uh, violence prevention or restorative justice programs, received uh, partial funding. Great, okay, thanks. <coughs> thanks, thanks to each of you. One, one is um, struck by kind of the scope of what we have going on in the state, really listening to each of you, uh, 48 CTC new communities, um, 54 school districts on the school health grant program, very impressive scope there as well. Um, OBH is rolling out um, just has some 60 pro providers and a needs assessment I know underway about uh, where to go next with prevention. <laughs> While we're at it, I forgot to tell a little story about Jenny because um, I met uh, Jenny a year or so ago. She called and said, let's have coffee. And I said, great. And Catch, you know, learn about each other's work and so forth. And we were going to meet uh, down the street here at a Starbucks. And then um, a day or two later, I get a, one of these Outlook invitation, email invita invites, and it's, it's to meet at Starbuds uh, <laughs> dispensary across the street. I go, wow, this woman's really putting her whole heart and soul into this uh, work. Starbuds, you know, is a marijuana dispensary, a chain here in the urban. In the, so anyway, I... I figured it out. I made that calendar invite without my glasses. Uh -huh. so I had intended Starbucks. 
and we'll just let you guess. Yeah. And then with Tony Gramsis also funding lots of programs. Um, I'm curious, in, in the audience, have, have people worked with these four groups in some way or another over time? Yeah, many of you? Okay, good, good. Um, we wanted to hear a little bit about how you're measuring progress, how you're assessing progress in, in, the, in these initiatives. So maybe we could turn to that as a next question. Um, you wanna go the same order, Allie? Okay. So, um with measuring progress in the CTC model, there's a lot of process measures, as you would imagine. Um, there's the milestones and benchmarks, which is kind of the, the process tool that takes communities through the five stages of CTC, which you could see in your folder on that handout. Um, so a lot of process measures for now, uh, since we're only 12 to 18 months into a lot of the community implementation. Um, we're also using the Healthy Kids Colorado survey. Um, David Hawkins referenced the PACE survey in Pennsylvania and how that used a lot of CTC questions, similar here in the state of Colorado. So um, HKCS is a, um, actually from a directive from the governor's office for state agencies to work together to implement one survey in schools. Because um, anybody here work in schools? How many of you are sick of the state giving you surveys? <laughs> So starting in 2011, um, the, it was an agreement across state agencies to all contribute to one survey in schools so that we weren't bombarding schools with a variety of different survey instruments and then uh, getting survey fatigue and a refusal to participate in any. Uh, many districts were creating that policy because there was just too many coming at them. And so we've been able, so the HKCS is a negotiated survey across a public health, interests, Department of Education interests, um, uh, human services interests, and then adding a variety of questions um, for the scaled risk and protective factors that are part of the CTC model. Um, so that survey is administered every other year. That's how we are tracking um, improvements to risk or uh, to reduce risk or improvements to increase protection across the state. And that's also how we're evaluating a lot of our outcomes uh, related to use substance abuse, violence, um, uh, and a few other indicators that we're looking at for our outcomes. Uh, we are supplementing that with some other community measures where, um, where we couldn't get uh, more questions onto HKCS. If you work in schools and you've been part of administering the survey, you also know it's very long. <laughs> so where we couldn't get more questions onto the survey, we're trying to use other data sources within a community. Um, so we have baselines in um, almost all of our communities or they're working on it right now. Um, to make sure that their community is participating in HKCS. Um, and uh, then we'll be monitoring that over time. Um, I think that's about it. Oh, and then, um, so that's evaluating CTC overall. So that's evaluating risk, that's evaluating protection, that's evaluating the process um, and whether or not we're implementing with fidelity. But what about the strategies that communities implement? Um, so uh, if you're funded by these other programs, um, most of the funding streams tend to have their own evaluation um, support and, and processes for communities to participate in depending on where the funding comes from. If you're implementing strategies, we have a menu of evidence-based, um, more systems change strategies for communities to implement, um, to supplement what's available in the blueprints programs, and uh, to really think about how do you institutionalize some of um, those changes. And so how will we evaluate um, that institutionalization of change um, through policy change, through systems change, um, through community norms change. And we're working with the Colorado, um, the CU Boulder uh, Center for St Study and Prevention of Violence to uh, create a evaluation tools depending on which strategy those communities select to implement. Um, so we don't want to duplicate if you're already doing, um, if you're already funded by a different program and doing that evaluation, we're not going to make you evaluate it for our purposes as well. Um, but if you do select any of the systems change strategies that are part of our menu, um, then we have uh, the evaluation tools from the university. Just to piggyback on what Ali is saying, also within the School Health Professional Grant Program, uh, we will be using uh, Healthy Kids Colorado survey uh, for our students. We'll be using Smart Source, uh, which is at the school and district level where they are evaluating the, the state of their school, I guess is the best way to refer to that, and what's going on in the culture of their school. They will have district level surveys and then within our work as TA providers and for me as a grant manager, 
we will be asking them to submit mid-year and end-of-the-year reports where they, I feel very strongly just dealing with other grants and what the previous grant cycles within this one has done, they, within their own work, work plans and end of the year reports, they provide their data on the successes of their work for that year. Uh, our program itself uh, at CDE and in our health and wellness office, we will evaluate our work from our end and the success of the grant. We will be looking for things such as number of students who have uh, had behavioral health survey, behavioral health referrals throughout the year. We will be looking at the data for um, how many students were impacted in the different types of programs and curriculum that they put in place in their program, such as life skills, which many are using, sources of strength, um, MEI, which is a Colorado-based promising practice program, and that's Marijuana Education Initiative, which uh, many districts are starting to use more and more. And the struggle for, uh, for the districts and for us uh, in the Health and Wellness Office is supporting them as best we can uh, with more evidence-based programs around the marijuana education because there aren't a lot out there right now. And so, you know, we are still working to build uh, from the Health and Wellness Office. One of my team members is responsible for building the Marijuana Resource Bank to uh, add to those evidence-based resources, put in that resource bank, some promising practice ones that will go before the board to see if they can be put into the resource bank. And hopefully as that continues to grow, that will give them added support also so that they can have better direction in their own evaluations in the program. At the Office <coughs> excuse me, of Behavioral Health, we're currently undergoing a statewide needs assessment. And what we're doing is we're looking at primary prevention efforts across the state, across systems. So different state agencies, and the goal is that it's not owned by OBH, it's a state agency needs assessment, so we can really work together and collaborate at looking at where the gaps are with prevention, where the needs are, and it's a data-driven needs assessment where we just finished the data component, now the contractor's moving into the writing piece, and the last component of this needs assessment was statewide community forums where people from stakeholders, professionals, families were able to give their feedback and input on where prevention programs are. And we're really looking at the difference among state agencies and if there is a way to reduce any duplication that's going on, not eliminate what one state agency is doing, just working smarter together. And once the needs assessment is complete in February, we'll move into strategic planning and that will be across state agencies. So that's really exciting. So stay tuned. Information should be coming after the holidays. So to piggyback on that, um, Jenny and I actually met a few weeks ago and I was talking to, I, I just talked to Emily um, <laughs> about the gaps analysis. Um, and ironically, um, TGYS is also going to be doing a gaps analysis in conjunction with Colorado 9 to 25. So we're kind of like, oh, there we go again, um, duplicating possible services. So we're trying to get them in touch with each other so that we aren't duplicating um, those same um, projects and we're really collecting um, better data. So we'll be working together with them um, to, to provide um, more information. Um, but we did fund Colorado 9 to 25. Our board voted to um, provide them some funding because we work with them through the statewide youth development plan, which is also um, in statute. So that will be happening with TGYS. Um, in addition, we are, um, we contract an evaluator and because we're at the beginning of a new grant cycle, um, we have just, um, we have just uh, selected our vendor. So um, I'm happy to say since I'm here, Butler Institute will be doing our evaluation for TGYS for this next grant cycle. And um, we're in the process of working with them to see what that evaluation will look like. Um, 
we do um, a marijuana um, survey, we will be renaming that survey because we've had um, issues with that in the past where um, communities and schools haven't wanted to use that assessment because it's called a marijuana survey. So it will um, soon be known as the TGYS survey um, with a few marijuana questions um, involved. So we hope that that will maybe make it easier for communities to um, get on board with that. Um, we also are changing a little bit of our strategy as how we collect data. Um, in the past, we provided, I think, 16 different tools um, as options to use for surveys. And as you all know, um, our young people have um, survey fatigue, and they really get tired of taking the same types of surveys over and over. So we're working to use um, the evaluation tools that organizations are already using and try to provide that information in a comprehensive way um, rather than adding more surveys to their plate. Um, we'll see how that goes. Um, I hear from Butler that that could be a challenge, so we'll see what that looks like. But um, it's a goal of ours to make it easier for them and to provide better data um, rather than watered down um, information to back out to um, our communities. So um, that is in the works, and I think there was one other thing I wanted to say, but it's not there. I'll come back to it. We'll come back. All right. Thanks. Um, this brought to mind one other question, uh, uh, and you started to touch on it a little bit. One thing we talk about in the Unleashing the Power of Prevention framework <laughs> is, is the need for state entity systems to work together. We, we tend to work in kind of siloed fashions due to funding streams and, and the like. I think there started to be a few examples, maybe Jenny and, and uh, Christy, you touch on that. Are there examples of where you, the four of you and your departments are working together? Can someone maybe speak to that? Uh, oh, anybody? I think all the time. Um, I think what's, um, I think the biggest challenge is it's already difficult enough for many local community partners to know how to get money from the state and who to work with and what that means. And so they learn how to navigate one system mm -hmm. and then a different state agency has a slightly different system. And so I, to me, I think the biggest barrier is actually at the local level to, um, to really get funding and see connections across the work because I think we coordinate and collaborate mm -hmm. and we talk about the overlaps of our, um, our, the desired outcomes that we want to see and where each of our programs kind of play a role either in the primary prevention side at the individual level like TGYS and mentoring programs funding those versus primary prevention funding systems change and policy change. Some of that is related to um, OBH's funding in communities, some of that's CTC's work um, some of it's our sexual violence prevention work, our suicide prevention work. And so I think at the state, we kind of know how, how we connect, um, but then we give out money in silos. And so, and communities are used to applying to OBH for funding or to CDPHE for funding. And um, we have different funding cycles and different reporting requirements for each of our funding. So I think that's often where the breakdown happens and it's very, uh, this is where the bureaucracy is hard. Um, it's, it's hard for us to change that. Um, and so what we can do, and I think the Colorado 9 to 25 system is really trying to pull state agencies together um, with local voice, youth voice, um, to try and change how we connect, how we work together, how we share our training resources, how we share our data, how we share um, information across to, so that at the local level there's better understanding of how you can use funding from all these different agencies to create and implement a, a whole spectrum of prevention within a community, that this is all complementary, um, that the, the work really can happen together to create um, high quality prevention that's addressing risk and uh, reducing risk and improving protection within communities. Um, but I think since different agencies, you know, for instance, violence prevention and built environment um, the fifth floor at CDPHE provides funding to communities to actually change how their community is structured physically so that they can reduce violence. They also want to improve, um, uh, they want to reduce obesity, that's kind of their goal, but um, we see it as an opportunity to also reduce violence based on how their community is structured. And so how that funding ties into the work we're doing with CTC, but it's such different people. People who care about how their environment is structured are very different than people who think about doing um, substance abuse prevention. And so how do we support, uh, I think more so than how do we work better together, how do we support locals to understand what it means to work together 
because our systems are so um, unique in learning how to navigate working with each of us um, that I think that, that that's where we could improve the most, yeah. Yeah. more so than necessarily mm -hmm. our communication yeah. one to the next. That's a good point. Anybody else? Uh, well, let me, um, I'd like to open it up to some questions from the audience. Would you, yes, would you like to come to the microphone? And well, I'm you, loud, I'm just sure, but, uh, okay. <laughs> Everybody hear that? The question was how how are how are uh, the voices of youth being heard or evaluated in in uh, in specific programs? I guess that you're maybe funding. Perhaps that's one way to think about. It. Does anybody want to take that on? Okay, Christy. You wanna? So, so I I can't speak to the online piece as much because um, that's not something that I really work with. But I can tell you that uh, our program we actually have a. Uh, youth um, who is on our team. Um, she's been with us for a year and a half. She's a youth advisor that we share with CDPHE. Um, we have extended her contract through um, the end of the year and she has actually become one of our program specialists now and actually goes out and will be working with 10 grantees. Um, she um, goes to site visits and provides her voice around um, uh, what is happening on, in those programs. Um, she is trained in PYD, positive youth development. She actually is a trainer that's available throughout the state um, mm -hmm. for PYD. Um, we also have two youth um, board members who by statute were required to have two youth board members. So they serve on our board and make decisions. Um, and it's been amazing to watch their growth, all of them, um, and how they, once they feel empowered and they know that we respect their voice, that they speak up and they provide some really great information. So for our program, that's the youth voice that we capture and that's what we do. And I'd like to add to that, uh, we were just talking about the Healthy Kids Colorado survey. I think there are many districts that are um, adding the voice in in those surveys with the online students and the alternative schools to make sure that they capture everyone in the district. I can't say that that goes on in every district, but uh, in some there is. And another piece of the youth voice, uh, we have a lot of districts throughout Colorado that have been part of uh, what's called healthy schools. And so with that healthy schools work, they've received throughout many years different grants from Colorado Health Foundation, Kaiser, CDPHE, CDE, uh, and they've created a very, very strong network which enabled them to feel more prepared in going into applying for, example, this school health professional grant, which uh, would piggyback on their existing healthy schools work. And I say that because these, the expectation here with the School Health Professional Grant is that they will work together with their existing work that's going on already in their district. And many of the districts have their health and wellness teams, their health and wellness committees at the school level and at the district level, and they all require uh, part of that membership to be a youth voice. And they will have middle school, elementary, high school level students involved in those teams. And that's been an exciting piece for us to see through the years as Healthy Schools work has grown and now we're able to connect it with the School Health Professional Grant along with what Allie was saying with uh, PYD training that goes on with many of our students throughout the state. Just one more thing, the, the CTC model does have a work group for youth engagement. Um, so at the local yeah. level, every CTC community should be engaging um, youth directly through their coalition work um, and making sure that that local voice is represented um, from their youth. And then I'll just do another plug for Healthy Kids Colorado survey. It is an opt-in survey, so any school can participate. It is free of charge to them. They do receive a question-by-question uh, report that provides all of their responses for their students at the school level as well as at the district level um, so that they can see broken down by gender, by race, ethnicity, by um, grade, 
their responses to each of those questions. And then we are also, um, we can support th that scaled report that uh, David Hawkins was showing in his, um, in his presentation with the different risk and protective factors. Those are actually scales across multiple questions. Uh, and so we have that available to schools upon request as well to be able to look at those risk and protective factors at the building level. But it really comes down to a community identifying, and again, it's not the school that cares, it's not the coordinator that cares, um, it's not just the public health agency that cares, it's the, the community that cares, to see that data as a shared resource for the community, um, that uh, schools are invested in being a part of that community voice and sharing that data back out to help inform those decisions that are being made within that that area. Okay, thanks, Ellen. Have a question here? Uh, <coughs> uh, Tracy? Ms. Phillips, this is for you, if you don't mind. So we've been talking about um, evidence-based practice and uh, things like that. So I'm curious that if we do know and understand that, for example, the Just Say No campaign is ineffective, mm -hmm. um, and we know that, I'm curious then to understand what move is PDE taking to say to schools then, okay, we need to do something different. Because just as recently as last Friday, all the kids were dressing up in their red shirts and seems to be an ongoing kind of belief system and programs are not effective and we're missing an opportunity for something else. So I'm curious to know at the Colorado um, Board of Education, you know, what are you all doing mm -hmm. to kind of innovate that? And um, Thanks. Well, I'm going to start by saying I'm not going to speak for the board. <laughs> um, but that is a, a very important question that you're asking and very valid. Uh, I can tell you that throughout many of the grants that I've worked with, the one thing that I have learned is as a TA provider that and it's hard because it's manpower, you know, a lot of times. But getting out, it, it does me no good to sit in my office. Once we get this, this grant off the ground, it's about being in the field. And it's about knowing the communities, knowing the schools, understanding what the culture is that's going on there in those buildings. And I can tell you that it's not enough for me to go out into a district, out into a school, meet with grant managers, and now going forward with the school health professionals, but I have to I have to understand the culture of that school and know the administrators. Because if you don't have administrator buy-in and administrator support in the work that's going on in the building from those school health professionals or any of the grants that are going on, it, it's hard to move that work forward. You can throw as much money at them as you can, but it all comes down to the climate and the culture of the school as you start to make those changes. And I wish I had a magic wand to say that that happens overnight, but to emphasize the work that has to happen at the school and district level in appreciating what that culture is in your school to make those changes happen also. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know. Yeah, Thanks. It's so complicated. Which kind of piggybacks to the survey piece of your question. I'm sorry, I'll be done in a moment. Um, <laughs> in delivery to youth and engaging youth, um, I'm looking to understand what are you all doing that is a bit more innovative? Like you said, the youth surveys, you know, their eyes glaze, especially when you start saying prevention, prevention, prevention. So I'm interested in knowing too then what are you all doing differently or some ideas or tips to engage our youth? So anybody, we have time for maybe one response. Then we'll have to move on. Anybody want to take that on? Go ahead. Okay. Well, you guys chime in though. Um, so caller nine twenty five. It actually written into statute is a state youth development plan, yeah. and the caller nine to twenty five framework actually their initial kickoff was fifty percent youth at the table, fifty percent adults. This was not just a few token youth representing the youth voice. This was true youth engagement across the entire state. 
um, to contribute to what the youth development plan should look like, what their priorities are, what it means to change the systems and how those systems serve youth within our state and provide resources to them. And um, from there, I think many different state agencies who maybe did not have youth advisors now have youth advisors. Um, a lot has changed within our infrastructure, the statewide positive youth development plan. Uh, or, and trainings that have become available, actual student advisors being the ones that go out and do a lot of those trainings within the state. So um, with only one response, trying to provide a high level, but. I would, I would just add that I know that our youth advisor, Jocelyn, um, is looking at um, putting together some trainings um, for the CTC programs to help them um, learn how to implement youth advisors. Um, what does that look like? Um, how do you engage? Um, how do you have a plan um, uh, to bring them on board because onboarding is critical. Um, so Jocelyn is really on the forefront. Um, she also leads a group of youth advisors. They're called SIN. I, don't, I can't remember what that stands State for. State Youth Network. State Youth Network. <laughs> um, and so they meet together to talk about what's working for them and how um, how do they get other youth engaged to be advisors and how do they get state agencies and community partners to bring on youth advisors. They give really good feedback back to the state system about what we're doing wrong to truly engage youth voice, which is they awesome. do. <laughs> okay, well, I'm, I hate to cut this short, but I guess I'm going to have to. We're going to have to move on to, a, to the second panel before lunch. I'd like to thank Christy, Allie, Phyllis, and Jenny for their very good responses. And we wanted to, this panel was especially designed to give you kind of an overview of what's going on in the state in terms of what's being funded and what kinds of programs and interventions are out there. So hopefully that was helpful. We're going to move to a discussion of, of enhancing infrastructure. I'd like to invite uh, Rick Catalano to come up, who's going to moderate this session along with the panelists. And please sit tight. We'll, we'll make this quick uh, change really very quickly. <clears throat> 